Okay, so today we're going to talk about pulmonary function testing. So pulmonary function testing is a way to determine the functional status of the lungs as it relates to how much gas can be moved, how fast the gas can be moved, the stiffness of the lungs and the chest wall, the diffusion ability of the alveolar capillary membrane, and patient's response to treatment. So why would we even perform pulmonary function testing? And that's to see if patients have uh, presence of lung disease. So when we talk about asthma, COPD, um, pneumonia, interstitial lung disease, uh, we can really see that on pulmonary function testing. Preoperative screening, so if a patient has some lung conditions and they're scheduled for a surgery, it would be really nice to see how they're going to do. It's kind of a good predictor to see how they're going to do when they go in under anesthesia. Uh, it evaluates patients for weaning, research pulmonary physiology, and to follow the progression of a disease or effects of therapy, and then study the effects of exercise on lung function. So the main components of pulmonary function testing are one, spirometry, two, measuring patients' lung volumes and capacity, and three, actually measuring their diffusion ability across the alveolar capillary membrane. So this is what we call a body plasmograph, or another word for it is a body box. And this is what you would use to actually measure the patient's total lung capacity and all the volume in their lungs. Okay. Uh, the body plasma, uh, plasmograph can also do airway resistance studies, and we can look for lung diffusion also in this device. Now, this machine is big, it's expensive, it's hard to run, so this would be reserved for really specialty pulmonary labs. Once again, when we talk about normal values and predictors of the lung values, um, we have to look at patient's sizes, okay? So we couldn't have Shaquille O'Neal and his partner, they don't have the same lung size because of height difference, okay? So that's one thing we have to make sure that we are being critically detailed about is measuring uh, the patient's height. So when we look at pulmonary function measurements, uh, what we're gonna look at are the different lung volumes and capacity. So your lungs are made up of four different volumes. The four different volumes are inspiratory reserve, tidal, expiratory reserve, and residual volume. So inspiratory reserve, tidal, expiratory reserve, and residual, okay? So those four volumes are in your lungs all the time. So everybody, take a big deep breath with me and blow it out. <coughs> okay, good. So what you guys just did is you went from a tidal breath, okay, you went all the way up into your inspiratory reserve, blew out as hard as you could to your expiratory reserve, but you know what you guys could not do? Get down into your residual volume. Based on what we know about anatomy and physiology, why can't you get down there? It definitely includes the uh, what we call functional residual capacity. So what that is is, have, remember when we talked about some of the ventilatory, such as Laplace's law, uh, and when we talk about um, compliance of the lung and chest wall and our thoracic cavity, due to 
how our uh, lungs, if you let them completely go, due to the, due to the um, collagen fibers they have, what do they want to do? Okay. Absolutely just collapse. Without muscle, what would our chest wall want to do? Collapse. Well, it really wouldn't want to contract in. What would it want to do? Expand. Exactly, expand. So when we're always looking at the balancing forces of the lungs wanting to collapse and the thoracic cavity wanting to expand, that means we have a leftover volume in our lungs at all times. Because if we had to go from zero of baseline pressure, would our, would our, would our musculature and our energy be available to use that much energy every single breath? No, because if we remember Laplace's law, it would take too much pressure due to the surface tension in our lungs and having to re-expand those small air sacs every single time. So this is what is left in our lungs that prevents them from collapsing at every single breath, and that's called our residual volume. Now you'll notice when there's uh, two or more volumes we get into what are called lung capacities. Okay, so the, let's do it again. Everybody take a big deep breath in. Blow it out. Good. What you guys all did is just went through your vital capacity. Vital capacity is made up of your inspiratory reserve volume, your tidal volume, and your expiratory reserve volume. Okay, so we just called out our vital capacity all of the volumes that we can use in our lungs. If you look at just your inspiratory reserve volume as well as your tidal volume, this is your inspiratory capacity, and your expiratory reserve volume and your residual volume, this, and you might have heard of this before, is your functional residual capacity. This is what is left on exhalation. Okay, so this is what, this is the physiology of both our lungs and our thoracic cavity together. And this allows for a little bit of expansion in our lungs on exhalation at all times. When you add all four of these together, that's where you get the patient's total lung capacity. Okay, and the normal values for all of these are based predominantly on the patient's height. Of course, it's also based on gender, and it really isn't based on weight too much, because as your patient gains weight, especially if it's just adipose tissue, do, do your lungs really get to be a bigger volume? No, they don't. They actually get more restricted as we put on um, unneeded fat tissues. But, but the lungs don't get bigger. They grow as our thoracic cavity grows and as we, um, as we get taller um, as children and adolescents, then that's when our, when our lungs grow. There are also differences in ethnicities as well. And so um, generally it's just, um, according to manufacturer, manufacturers, Generally, it's just Caucasian and African American have different sizes, but we do look at Latin Americans and Asian Amer Americans too. So they actually have an entire chart of um, different males, females, age, height, and ethnicities. And when we measure that, that's already in the spirometers themselves. Okay. Now, you might be asking me what this little story is over here, okay? This is your mnemonic to memorize the four volumes and capacity. So, the loving couple, Herb and Irv, took their TV on vacation in their RV. For the trip, they bought ice and fried chicken. The loving couple, Herb and Irv, took their TV, okay, on vacation in their RV, they bought ice and fried chicken. So, if that helps, 
two, fantastic. Believe me, someday when you're trying to memorize those, you're going to say, what was that thing that Jamie taught me? Okay, so I would, I would kind of think about that. Because guess what? You guys can't memorize all this. <laughs> so let's look at tidal volume. Tidal volume is the volume of air that normally moves in and out of the lungs in one quiet breath. Okay, so during quiet breathing. It can be decreased in both obstructive and restrictive disorders, and we can measure this via simple spirometry. Same with our IRV, it can be measured with spirometry. It's the maximum volume of air that can be inhaled after a normal tidal volume. Okay, so it can be within normal limits or decreased in both obstructive and restrictive disorders. It can also, as I said, be measured by spirometry. The ERV can also be measured by spirometry. It's the maximum volume of air that can be exhaled after a normal tidal volume. It can be decreased in both restrictive disease um, and obese individuals, which would cause a restriction. Okay. So one thing that cannot be measured via simple spirometry is our residual volume because as we already did that maneuver, we couldn't exhale, we couldn't push out all the, all the air out of our lungs. Because if you did that, I'd be grabbing the blind scope and intubating you and putting you on a ventilator because your oxygen would significantly drop, right? So uh, we would have to measure this in the body box. Okay, we would have to measure that in a body box. So, the residual volume is the amount of air remaining in the lungs after a maximal exhalation. And it's equal to our functional residual capacity minus your residual volume. Or, I'm sorry, your FRC minus your expiratory reserve volume. So, do you see that? These two volumes make up the capacity a functional residual. So if you wanted to see what this was, if you measured that and subtracted the ERV out, you could get your residual volume. Okay. Of note, and what's in this, uh oh, it's in red, right? Okay, so the RV, the residual volume, is approximately 20% of the total lung capacity. What do you think would happen, or what kind of disorders would increase that residual volume. Patients that are doing what? Okay, not compensating as much, but trapping air. Okay, yeah, patients that are trapping air into their lungs, such as patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, or how about patients when they're having an asthma attack? Okay, so they can get the air in, but they can't do what? Because of all that airway resistance, they can't exhale all that air out, okay? So it'll be significantly increased as the obstructive disorder progresses. Okay, so as we said, lung capacities are adding two or more volumes together uh, called a capacity. So here we are again. The vital capacity is measured after the person has taken the deepest breath possible. When we do the maneuver called a forced vital capacity, and that's what we're going to look at today, um, that gives us a lot of good information about the patient's functional status. Okay? So we can either do a forced or a slow vital capacity, and that is inspiratory reserve plus tidal volume plus expiratory reserve. Those three volumes together are your vital capacity. And if we said, residual volume is 20% of the TLC, the remaining portion then, your vital capacity, is approximately 80% of total lung capacity. Vital capacity is measured via spirometer and it can be decreased in both obstructive and restrictive diseases. It's a good preoperative assessment, um, it looks at the ability of the patient to take a deep breath and cough postoperatively or with mechanical ventilation. So kind of a critical number for a vital capacity is about 15 mils 
per, per kilogram of ideal body weight for a patient. If it's less than that, then that patient's pulmonary reserve will not be efficient and they cannot breathe spontaneously. They'll most likely have to stay on the ventilator. The inspiratory capacity is the volume of air that can be inhaled after a normal exhalation. It is measured via spirometer. It can be normal or decreased in both obstructive and restrictive disorders. And then the functional residual capacity is the volume remaining in the lungs following a normal exhalation. And it is expiratory reserve plus the residual volume. And it's the balance between the expanding chest wall forces and the contractile rebound forces of the lung tissue due to that elastic, uh, due to those elastic collagenous fibers. What's that? FRC is measured with spirometer, with the spirometer. Okay, you, I would like for you to answer that. What do you think? It's a very good question. Do you think that functional residual could be measured via spirometry? No, because we need the RV for the body. Yeah, very good. Okay, excellent. We're going to 